In previous video, we saw the rise and fall of Shaka Zulu. We saw Dingani meet his end at the hands of his half-brother. And we saw the Zulu and the Dutch come to an uneasy truce. This week we'll see how European and native relations evolved as the 19th century moves on. But before we have to answer the questions, what did Europeans do in Africa? Who were they? Why were they there? What relation did they have to one another? Let's go back in 1652. The Dutch under the Dutch East India Company first settled Cape Town and sort of lay claim to South Africa. But that was like 150 years before our story started. We're looking at the late 18th and early 19th century here. And what was happening in Europe in the late 18th and early 19th century? Right. There was Napoleon. During the French Revolution, French armies conquered the Dutch Republic and the ruler of the Dutch Republic, the Prince of Orange, fled to Britain and asked them to take over his colonies so they wouldn't fall into the hands of the rampaging French. This left the Dutch in South Africa in a strange state of limbo. They were now ruled by the British, but were citizens of a nation which no longer existed and might never come back for them. Many of the Dutch colonists chafed under British rule, and as the British began to expand their colonial efforts far more actively than the Dutch ever had, Dutch settlers began to move into the previously uncolonized interior of the country to escape British expansion. And in doing so, they started to see themselves as independent, neither British nor Dutch, but rather as a part of their own South African nation, the Boers. That's how they referred to themselves as they moved inland. The Boers began to set up their own republics on native territory, often Zulu territory. Thank you for supporting my channel with your likes when I ask you like right now. Don't forget to subscribe to the channel and press the bell. Thank you, bro. The Zulu leader Mpande, we talked previous video, considered a weak king just because he was less warlike than his relatives. He negotiated a treaty defining borders with the British and then gave additional lands to the Boers. But the British weren't just going to let the Boers expand, so this is where the British really started to encroach on Zulu sovereignty. They claimed that the land given to the Boers was in violation of the treaty the Zulus had made with them and pressured Mpande into retaking the area. Thereafter, Mpande attempted to navigate the tightrope of keeping both the Boers and the British happy. And the Zulu people began to doubt in his decisions. Then power took his son Chechwayo not by killing his father, but by killing his brother. He began a new diplomatic policy that aimed at keeping peace with both the colonial powers while giving far less away to the Europeans than his father. After that, somebody discovered diamonds in the area. And this always screws things up. European miners started pouring into South Africa and with them shopkeepers, tool traders, geologists, and all the other support personnel that a major mineral rush needs. For the most part, the Zulus and the surrounding tribes were content working a diamond mine is unpleasant. The Zulu already had all they needed with their farms and their cattle, and now with all these essentially unproductive Europeans flooding in the Zulu, could get a pretty good price for any surplus food they grew. The mining conglomerates wanted more workers for their mines, but the Zulus didn't want to work there. This led mining conglomerates to offer guns for labor and the British government to start taking more drastic steps toward expansion. The British wanted to get any potential diamond mines they could, which meant pushing into native and for territory at an unheard of rate. At the same time, the British also wanted to start consolidating their hold over South Africa in general and to integrate the outlying tribes with the growing diamond economy. Doing this basically meant destroying the traditional South African way of life and stepping on agreements made with the Boers. And now we meet Sir Henry Bartle Frere. He did very well in India some time ago, so his solution was basically annex and suppress everybody. The local political elite tried to warn him that with the recent British expansion, tensions were high and any minor event might fur the whole region into war. But Frere was having none of that, and began looking for an opportunity to expand. However, the local government of Cape Town did not agree with his actions, and Frere removed them from power and have himself granted total governmental control over South Africa. Shortly after this, he enacted a law that demanded that all native Africans had to give up their guns, but not Europeans. Very cunning. Nobody was falling for that one. The native tribes were much smarter than Frere expected. Frere decided to use the mighty British Imperial Army, 
But being unfamiliar with the terrain, not accustomed to the weather and burdened by their heavier armaments, the British army couldn't even find the rebels, not to mention winning. Finally, Frere called back in the local frontier commando troops of the Cape Colony government. The commandos managed to engage and defeat some of the rebelling tribesmen. While this allowed Frere to annex their land, it sent much of the rest of South Africa into a guerrilla war that would nearly bankrupt Cape Colony. But this wouldn't stop Sir Bartle Frere. He saw the escalating conflict simply as an expedient. That's why on December 11th of 1878, Frere sent the ultimatum to the Zulu king, demanding that he disband his armies entirely and accept a British observer into his court. He gave the Zulu king one month to comply. These demands were impossible, needless to say. On January 11th, 1879, the British and the Zulu Empire were at war. But Lord Chelmsford, the commander-in-chief for the British forces in South Africa, underestimated the Zulus. He saw the native forces as fundamentally weak and inferior to European ones. Yes, in the past, he had encountered native forces that had avoided pitched battle and had fought guerrilla campaigns against him. But simply lumping all the tribes together and assuming that they were alike would be a fatal mistake. He ordered the three columns of his force to split up with the plan for all of them to converge on the Zulu capital. But as Chelmsford ranged forward, chasing decoys or an illusory Zulu army, the real Zulu force was working their way around his column. On the morning of the 22nd, into the British camp, which guarded with 1,800 defenders, reports began to filter of a huge Zulu force headed their way. By 10 a.m., the camp commander had sent word of this to Chelmsford. But Chelmsford was convinced that it must be some small diversionary unit, not the main Zulu force. He assumed the people in the camp were just getting jumpy. Soon the Zulu army was upon the camp. 20,000 arrayed against 1,800 defenders. The British had failed to fortify their camp, not even circling the wagons in the customary makeshift defense. The British camp commander, meanwhile, was really more of an administrator than a soldier. He didn't throw up any last-minute defenses, in fact. He did little more than having his drastically outnumbered men form a line as the Zulu charged. Luckily, thanks to the bull's horns formation devised by Shaka at the very inception of the Zulu Empire, every Zulu man knew his place. Every man knew what to do. The Zulu charged through the withering hail of rifle fire and artillery. The beleaguered and outnumbered defenders lived up to their training and put up a grim and stoic defense. Eventually, the Zulus had crushed the British defenders. It was the first defeat of the Army of Britain from technological lagging forces. Some of British soldiers ran away to Rourke's Drift, a small hospital encampment the advancing army had set up to handle the sick. The survivors, the sick, and those stationed at Rourke's Drift amounted to perhaps 140 British troops. Most of the men's first instinct was to flee, but one man named James Dalton, the acting assistant commissary officer, told them all that they would never outrun a fast-moving Zulu column while burdened with the sick and the wounded. They decided to fight and started to prepare themselves. Upon hearing of the approaching force, the order was immediately given to use everything they had to fortify Rourke's Drift. Flower bags and biscuit tins were turned into walls, Holes were punched in the sides of nearby wooden buildings for shooting through. Hospital beds were turned into barricades, and every soldier who could walk was positioned for the defense. Fortunately for them, the rapidly approaching Zulu force wasn't the same army that had crushed them at previous fight, but rather the loins of that force's bull's horns formation. The reserve force of 4,000 warriors that hadn't been committed in the main battle. They were commanded by Chechuayo's half-brother, a less disciplined, rash commander who had just now violated his orders to simply chase the enemy to the border of Zululand by crossing into British territory to raid Rourke's Drift. Just as the defenses were being completed, the Zulu force descended upon Rourke's Drift. After ten hours of fight, seventeen British troops lay dead, and about that many were wounded. But about 850 Zulu were dead or wounded. Despite this miraculous last stand at Rourke's Drift, the disaster at previous fight and other setbacks meant that the invasion of Zulu land was a failure. The British forces withdrew. But Chelmsford, desperate to repair his reputation, immediately began to prepare a second invasion, and the British government, now actively seeking to avoid any further loss of face, 
rushed in reinforcements and heavier artillery. Chechwayo attempted to negotiate with the British, knowing this second army to be an overwhelming force. But Chelmsford wouldn't hear of it. With the committed might of the British military at his back, Chelmsford finally attacked the Zulu capital. As the Zulu army lined up for their charge, they saw ten cannon and two Gatling guns arrayed on the other side of the field. Zulu warriors were cut down in swaths as they struggled to reach their foe. With this total defeat and the loss of their capital, the Zulu forces simply began to disperse. The mighty Zulu army was no more. The British captured Chechwayo shortly thereafter and carved the Zulu kingdom into 13 smaller sub-kingdoms, installing a new ruler into each one. Almost immediately after these kingdoms were created, they fell into conflict and what can only be called civil war. Chechwayo, meanwhile, was brought back to England where, surprisingly, he was treated like royalty in exile. He even met with Queen Victoria. Finally, he was returned to the throne of Zululand. It happened because the Zulu civil war had gotten out of hand at this point, and they hoped that returning him would reunify the region. Unfortunately, it did not succeed. Shortly after he returned to Zululand, he was attacked by a rival and died a few months later. He was succeeded by his son, who made great headway in taking back his ancestral flame by allying himself with the Boers, granting the Dutch settlers large swaths of land in return for their help against his rivals. The British definitely couldn't allow that, though, and so in 1887, British forces finally annexed Zululand for good. And like that, the Zulu Empire was snuffed out. If you like the video, subscribe and write in comments which topics you want to see next. Thank you, bro.